Hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your virtual star party for July 15th, 2012, the Let's Hope for Pluto edition. Um, so tonight, uh, we've actually started a little bit earlier, and, and as you know, uh, as you probably know, the Earth's axis is tilted and, uh, and pointed at the North Star, and uh, the length of the summer, the length of the night in the summers is the shortest, and then it's the longest in the middle of the winter. And so right now we're at the point with the, with the shortest nights, and so we had to start um, very late. You know, we've been starting as late as like 9.30, but now as we're, we've passed the summer solstice and we're moving towards the equinox now, the starting times are getting earlier and earlier, which is great. And then the other thing we're going to do is we've now got, we've got astronomers on the East Coast. We've got Mike Phillips on the East Coast. We've got some astronomers uh, in the middle of the United States, and, so we've, and they're going to lose Saturn, so we thought we would just get started. So, so sorry if you were expecting us to be late as usual. We're actually a little bit early. Um, so tonight we've got, I'm hoping it's going to be a really special night. We've got, uh, let's see, who have we got here? We've got, so we've got Chris Ridgway, who's in Indiana. Can you hear us, Chris? Yeah. Okay, so Chris's view is this beautiful view of Saturn right now. Now, it's a little wobbly because uh, Saturn is, uh, is just starting to set for Chris. So we're probably only going to have Saturn for another 10, 15 minutes max before it goes behind a tree. So we thought we would just go live as quickly as we can. Uh, we've also got um, John Kramer. Who, you're in Tennessee, right, John? You got it, right? Yep. Middle Tennessee. So, perfect. And so John has also got a view of, of Saturn. And you can see uh, it's the same Saturn clearly, but uh, just a little bit tilted. And that's all just dependent on, on the way the camera has been attached to the telescope, so, you know, what the angle is. So we've got two Saturns for you right now. We've also got a live view of the sun, and this is coming from Teal Ristra, who's down in Australia. Where are you located, Teal? Sorry, what was that? Where are you? Where do you live in Australia, specifically? Oh, sorry, I'm in um, Brisbane, which is the capital city of uh, a state called Queensland here. Right. There we go. And you got that nice live view of the of the sun and you can see over on the left hand side you can see that great big sunspot group uh, AR 1520. This is the one that blew out a really big coronal mass ejection at us just a couple of days ago and has been giving people all around the world these beautiful aurora views. So there it is there. Um, then we've got Gary Ganella who is in Los Angeles and Gary is just starting to get dark skies now. So um, Hello, he's, everybody. Uh, he's just getting the telescope cooled down and, and ready to go. We've got uh, Mike Phillips, who's over in North Carolina, and that's sort of a view of, of, <laughs> of his potential night sky, which is a very small uh, portion of his overall sky. But w what we're hoping is within the next uh, couple of minutes, Pluto is going to make its way into that open spot, and, uh, and he's going to be able to try and bring us our first view of Pluto. So it's going to be really close to a, uh, a star cluster called M25, so we're going to try and see it tonight. We've got Mark Barrett, I'm, and I'm not sure. Mark is in Chicago, and this is Mark's view. And I'm not sure what Mark is uh, looking at right now. I'm trying to pull in the wild duck cluster. The wild duck cluster. Uh, um, it's just looking like a couple of stars right now. Yeah, Mark is the one who gave us the beautiful views of the moon just a couple of weeks ago, but he's in the very light polluted skies of Chicago, so when it's the moon, then it's uh, very bright and crystal clear, but otherwise he's having to fight light pollution. I usually get a good view of Saturn, too, but it's on the wrong side of my house. you got to move. Well, um, if, I, if I put my telescope in my driveway, I could probably see it, but I'm afraid somebody would walk by and steal my telescope because I live on a pretty busy street. That, that would be Chicago. Uh, and then we got Stuart Foreman, who is in uh, the San Francisco area, and it's still very bright for Stuart, you can see, so he's just waiting for it to get dark enough so that he can actually start to align the, uh, so he can actually align his telescope and, and then get, get started. So we're going to try and do a big Saturn handoff. So we've got Chris and John, who are about two, three time zones ahead of, uh, of where Stuart is, and so if everything works out well, uh, once they lose Saturn, Stuart will be able to pick it up and, and be able to continue showing it. So I'm hoping we'll get Saturn all the way through this whole evening. And then last but not least, we brought in some color commentary with uh, Ray Sanders, 
uh, dearastronomer.com, right, who is going to bring the science uh, with me. So this will be good. All right. So let's uh, let's just go back and enjoy this view of, of Saturn. Now, there's, there's, with Chris's view, you, I don't think you could see Titan. But I know with John's view, we're actually able to see Titan. I don't know if you can still see it, John. Maybe it's just the brightness. But just before we started the show, we actually had a, a little dot of star of, of Titan off to the side of, of Saturn. So, and if you yeah, if you change the brightness, you can actually see you can I actually see it. Good. Tell me if you guys pick it up. Yeah, but it was pretty far away to the sort of bottom left of Saturn. So if you can sort of reorient it a bit, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't see it anymore. That's too bad. So, but what you can see with both of them, if you look, you can, you should be able to see bands across the surface of the planet. <laughs> is that is that your background, Ray? I hear a child. What was that? I didn't think that she was going to be bleeding through. I'm oh, yeah. so sorry about that. Yeah, that's, that's right. literally, it's not quite her bedtime yet. We started early. Her bedtime's in about half an hour, so yeah. <laughs> I do yeah. apologize for that. That's I'll no keep problem. an eye on the mute button. No problem. Yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah, yeah, keep on the mute button. Um, yeah, so we can't see we can't see Titan, which is too bad. Um, I don't know, Chris, are you able to bring it in? Titan? Yeah. Um, not real sure. No. I don't want to mess. You'd have to mess with your brightness. Probably not. You're. It's really, really sort of hazy at this point. I can see why you were. You want, we really started so that we could get this view of Saturn from, from Chris and John, and you can see we're starting to lose Saturn already. Yeah, it's just about behind the tree for me. So, Ray, can you give us sort of a bit of an explainer on, on why planets are so hard to observe, objects are so hard to observe when it's close to the horizon? Sure. Um, you've got this uh, phenomenon called uh, air mass, and basically the closer to something the horizon is, the more air you're looking through. Uh, when you look at things uh, straight above you, you're basically looking through just one air mass. Whereas when you get uh, closer to the horizon, you know it's you know 1.5 up to you know two air masses. Um, part of the other thing that you can deal with too is um, some of the same phenomenon like um, uh, dust in the air and stuff like that. Um, that same phenomenon that you see a really red, beautiful sunset or moon rising, and it's all red and beautiful. Um, sometimes that can also uh, play into um, how things appear when you're looking at them when they're close to the horizon. Yeah, so I'm sharing with Stellarium right now. If anyone's wondering what this software is, this is Stellarium, and it's a great piece of software. You can get it on Linux, you get it on Windows, Mac, anything you want. And um, you can see, here's Mars, and I, I'm doing this view from Indiana, so this is kind of what uh, what what uh, Chris is seeing, and you can see how close to the horizon Saturn is, and you can see Mars is right above the horizon at this point, so there's, you know, no way he'd be able to show up Mars. Yeah, and there's a tree right about where Virgo is down a little bit. Yeah, and so, uh, um, well, there you go, Saturn is in Virgo right now, which I'm sure means something to somebody. Um, so, you now we're going to be uh, sort of doing this for probably an hour, hour and a half, so... If anybody wants to ask any questions, there's a few places you can look at it. You can uh, you can post your comments and questions uh, either on the Google Plus feed where this is being uh, broadcast. You can also, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can also put it there on YouTube. Also, if you want, you can send us a tweet with the hashtag uh, Star Party, and we'll get it there. Um, also, if you're watching this on the event page, we can also get it from there. So we should be able to sort of get it from all those locations. I'll be watching the comments and, and answer any questions that anybody has. Um, so, so Mike, are, are, are you able to concentrate, or are you uh, trying to work on the telescope right now? I want to ask you a couple of questions. I don't know if he's, uh, if he's there. Um, well, I'll sort of explain what Mike's plan was. So, so Mike is located in, uh, in North Carolina. His goal today is to try and get Pluto, which and this is the first time we've been, had a chance to bring Pluto into a, uh, into a virtual star party. And so you can see where Pluto is. Um, yeah, I'll show you, actually. It's because I just came back from the telescope, it's actually hiding. This is a little inverted. 
plastic. Unfortunately, behind this overhanging limb right here. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm just zooming in on Stellarium. Oh, okay. So here's here's where Pluto is. It's right behind that limb there. And so if you can see on my view of Stellarium, uh, it's really close to this object called M25. And there's Pluto there in the with the little red crosshairs there. And so the hope is that we'll be able to get Pluto as just a dot in the uh, um, just in the view, and we'll be able to have it with M25 in the same in the same region. So that's the that is the hope. That's the hope. Yeah, it's that's definitely going to clear that tree in the next half hour, maybe 45 minutes tops. Uh, there's a lot of haze out right now, which has got me a little worried. So. I was going to say, just looking at uh, my copy of Stellarium, uh, it looks like Pluto's in the thick of a band of the Milky Way. That's going to make it really tough with with a lot of the faint stuff that'll be in the background there. So it, it'll be really interesting yeah. to see if we can uh, discern it from everything else. Might have yeah. to come back in a week, take an image, take another week, yeah. and then do a quick uh, demonstration on blink comparators uh, on yeah. next week's Hangout. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and now the other thing too, and, and this is maybe a question for Gary that I didn't get a chance to ask you earlier. If Gary's still here, you yeah, need here's a type alpha filter. I would imagine you wouldn't be able to see Pluto even in hydrogen alpha at a really long exposure, right? Stars uh, and nebula and things like that—they're very emissive in, in HA, but I, I doubt Pluto is. I would I would think it would be very dim to non-existent. I would think it's going to show up because it's reflecting sunlight, and there's a lot of hydrogen alpha in the sunlight. Hmm. Um, I would I think it would be diminished, though, wouldn't it? I mean, at that magnitude 14 visual, you would probably expect it, to see it. It will be diminished, portion. but it also, you're cutting way back on the background light. So yeah. it's kind of a wash. Hmm. But uh, the planets and stuff, I can take, I can get real bright pictures of them in hydrogen alpha. Yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to see. I, I know you're... you're Far enough across the globe that say because it's in Sagittarius right now that you're probably still an hour or so from it even getting over the horizon, right? So a good one question here. James uh, Poli wants to know what's the difference for the mar what's the difference for the angles between the two views of Saturn? Is that caused by different view locations, or is it an artifact or something in the equipment? It's as simple as the fact of when you have the telescope, you have your camera attached to the telescope. And it just depends on how you've got the camera turned on the eyepiece of the telescope. And that just defines what, what the orientation is. They could go and rotate the camera on their telescope, and they would turn Saturn all the way around. So it's completely random. Um, with Gary, you've got your telescope actually specifically aligned in a certain way, right? Um, yeah, but it's still going to just depend on how it is against the sky. You know, yeah. As it moves, the tube's going to turn. So yeah. And it's also backwards. Yes, yeah. So it's completely random. Um, did we lose Teal's son? Bummer. That's too bad. It's quite okay. flat at the moment. Oh, man. All right, well, we'll be back. How does your sky look? Is it kind of mixed cloud? or? Yeah, it was clear earlier, but it's starting to be, like, it looks about 50% now. I always like it when you get, like, parts of the clouds coming in from the sun. I think it's pretty nice. Hopefully we'll get that. And if we're lucky, we'll get an airplane like we did with uh, Mark's view of the moon. Um, so, so then, uh, so Gary, what have you got for us? Uh, I'm on M16. That is a 60-second uh, exposure at uh, bin two by two, and I'm doing a 120 minute. I'm 10 seconds left on a 120 second exposure. It'll give us a little more contrast. My skies are um, not good seeing at all tonight. The stars are very blobby. I had I just couldn't get a good focus because it's all over the place. That's that's still a pretty nice view of M16. Yeah, here's a just going to get a little more contrast in this downloading right now. I will show people. I'll give people some context here. So, so M16 is uh, also known as the Eagle Nebula. And it's located just n above Sagittarius in the sky. So Sagittarius looks like this teapot. You can see Sagittarius here. It's this teapot here. Probably got too many deep sky objects going on right now. Let me turn some of them off. 
Okay, so M16 is located there where that blue guy is, and so there's Sagittarius there, and so I'll zoom in, and that's what and that's what Gary's looking at, and I think that looks very similar to what you're viewing. Now the next thing about M16, right, Eagle Nebula, this is the as we go in every week, this is the um, uh, this is where we find the uh, the pillars of creation, and I can see them beautifully in your view right now. They are there. So that's two minutes at a two by two bin, and I'm still um, I still got light skies. I'm not getting all the way to black, but I'm getting a pretty good image. So we're dark enough for this. It's great to see Stuart there setting up. You can see his darkening skies. It's cool. It's been getting darker and darker for him in the background. So still waiting for stars to pop out, though. Yeah, you still have any stars yet? Yeah, have you, you can't even see Saturn yet. I, I well, Saturn. I'm afraid it's going to be behind a tree for me. I'm not going to be able to see it. Um, but I, Vega just popped out. Okay. Just pretend it's Polaris and a line from there. Well, I could, um, actually. <laughs> um, so uh, Lady Pembroke wants to know what software I was using. It's called Stellarium, and it is fantastic. It is the nicest piece of astronomy software I've ever seen. I really like it. Did you lose Saturn, Chris? Yeah, I lost it. I'm going to... Go ahead and switch my cameras here and go okay. to deep sky now. You need to go to something, some deep sky object? Okay. I'm gone as well. And there's John's Saturn just about gone as well. Um, yeah, Ozzy Pete. Yes, we do have a, f a fellow Ozzy. This is uh, Teal Bristra is giving us the view of, uh, of the sun from Australia right now. Which is very cool. I love the fact that we have both the day sky and the night sky at the same time in one hangout which is really cool. Uh, what have you got there, Gary? Well, I was attempting to get the cat's paw, but it's behind a tree. I thought it would be too low. It's gonna so you be, got a tree. It's going to be a month or so before uh, it moves out from behind those trees. But I thought I'd give it a shot. Um, so do you want another recommendation? Do you want to try M13, uh, Chris? What are you looking for? I know you're setting up there. Yeah, I'll take recommendations. I mean, anything... Uh, we will take requests. Um, uh, M13, I cannot get. It's probably too high in the sky. I'll be able I'm, to get it. You'll be I'm able limited to, get it. to under yeah, 60 degrees. Yeah, I just got degrees. polar line. Okay, well, will you start with... Or, or start with Saturn. It'd be nice to get a to get your view of Saturn. Uh, I'm, Saturn's going to be behind a tree for me. Oh, it is? Okay, all right. Yeah, sorry. We'll have to wait a little bit. Yeah. Anybody want to take a shot on the Ring Nebula? I'm moving to it right now. And I'll be able to get a color of it in a little bit. Oh, that'll be great. Right. I, did some t I don't know if anyone caught them. Um, we had a total surprise star party on uh, yesterday. Uh, Ahmet Kale, who's in Turkey, he, uh, he let me know just like a couple of hours beforehand that uh, Jupiter was going to be going behind the moon. So this is an occultation. And it was only visible to a small part of the Earth. And it only happens, it's only visible a couple of times a year. And, you know, you probably only get to see it from our locations once every three, four years probably. And uh, it was great. It was really neat to see it. You actually saw, you know, there was the moon and there was Jupiter and it disappeared behind uh, behind the moon. And then you could see uh, later on all of the moon started to poke out on the other on the other limb of the moon and, and it came out. Actually, Ahmet posted some video. We'll try and link up to that. But it was great to see that. Sombrero Galaxy. Where's the sombrero right now? That's already gone. It's, I saw it really low in the sky, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's um. It's already it's, it has already set. <coughs> Sorry, I'll show you here. Okay, I'm gonna switch yeah. out some of my camera. For the people on the east so coast, yeah. The for sky. us here on the west coast, some bros kind of low in the horizon still. So there's the sombrero right there for Chris. So you can see it's just. It's right on the on the horizon right now, but we'll switch over to uh, our side of the Earth. So let's go to say and so there there it is there. So this is what you can see it's a little higher in the sky. This is what Stuart's seeing now. 
Uh, M31, we're not going to be able to do M31. Um, it's just too low now. And M15? Sorry, I'm, I'm just seeing the requests that we're getting. M4, M9. Um, uh, M15 has just come up. It's uh, low in the east. Yep. And uh, that's another okay. globular cluster. Yep. So M4 should be okay. It's just near Antares. Let me see. Yeah, that should be okay. We should be able to get that. We'll just put that on the list. Um, very cool. All right, well, I think we'll go back and take a look at the sun. So uh, you have you been following this, uh, this AR-1520 sunspot at all, Ray? Uh, no, actually, right. I've been really busy. I just got my first published uh, paper earlier this week, so I've been busy following up with questions on that. So tonight, this week has been kind of a busy science week for me. So, so um, right, so I, I heard about it last week. Yeah. So what happens? So what it is? AR, so the the various sunspot groupings on the sun they give them des number designations, and so this one is AR fifteen twenty. I'm not sure what the AR part comes from, um, but uh, this is one of the largest. Uh, sunspot uh, complexes on the sun that have been there in the last couple of years. And the big hope, and we talked about this at the last star party, was, you know, our hope was that it would detonate a flare right at the Earth, and it actually did. So on um, Thursday, it detonated a, uh, a X-class flare. So there's like four different classes of flares, right? And right, the X those class are the yeah, the X class are the most powerful flares, and the, this was a this was a one X one point four, so it's like one of the most powerful of the most powerful flares. And this is exactly what you want. I mean, you know, uh, you want a gigantic flare that blasts directly at the Earth, unless you run a satellite or you run a power company. <laughs> right. You don't want that. Um, but you know, if you want uh, a beautiful aurora that's visible, really far south, that's what you want. And right. so. Um, and, and so if this, I understand this, correctly, I think a lot of people were hunting for Aurora yesterday, last night, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, people were seeing them in New Zealand. People were seeing them in Australia. People were seeing them in uh, Central Oregon. Uh, someone was seeing them in Arkansas. So, again, you know, and it's probably going to be sort of over the course of tonight as well. So if, you're, if you've got a little time to kill, uh, you know, head outside with a cup of hot chocolate and watch north or south you know, where you're on the Earth, and you might get a chance to see a, uh, uh, some aurora activity. If you've never seen auroras, I mean, it's, there's nothing like it. It's ghostly. It's, a, it's an amazing. Has anybody here never seen an aurora in the, in the group here? I've never seen one. You I never, never have. No. So, Frazier, one thing that I was going to say is uh, the last time that we had a really big solar flare, uh, I think it was earlier in the spring, a lot of people were expecting to see them as far south as, you know, Arkansas, Tennessee, yeah. Missouri, uh, northern Arizona. And what a lot of people um, in the, in the, for North America in the southern regions, they couldn't see them. But it turned out that a lot of people who were doing, uh, like, a DSLR deep sky photography for star trails, turns out that their cameras were picking up the auroras. So they couldn't wow. see them with the naked eye. But oh, they're picking them up. Their cameras picked them up on, like, 30 and 60 second exposure. So what I was going to say is that, you know, if, if anybody's out there trying to aurora hunt, if they've got a DSLR or a camera that can take, you know, 30-second exposures and a tripod, you might not see anything, but, you know, throughout the course of the night, what's it take? A few button presses yep. on your camera to take some 30-second exposures, and you might actually capture some of them on, on your camera. So uh, for everybody out there who might want to try and catch them, you know, take your camera with you, and if you don't see anything, don't despair. Try your camera. It, it's... You know, and plus the other thing is, too, like you are saying, take a cup of hot chocolate, coffee, you know, your drink of choice, and a nice, comfortable chair, and just enjoy the night sky if you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so here we go. So now we're cracking into some of our deep sky objects before we wait for Saturn to return. Uh, so we've got um, uh, the best, M57, which is the Ring Nebula. Certainly is. Did I just lose Did you lose your internet? You didn't lose your internet. Um, and I'll sort of so the Ring Nebula. This is a planetary nebula. This is uh, this is what our sun will look like about five billion years from now, when uh, it is turned into a red giant, puffed out its outer layers, and uh, and all that remains is the uh, this sort of central 
uh, ring of expanding material. What happened there, Gary? I just did a two-minute exposure, so let me stretch it a little bit and we'll get a little more detail here. Uh, Jamie, Martin, yeah. you staff should be chatting on the YouTube page or, or here. Any place is fine. You can you can make your comments on YouTube, on the Google Plus page, uh, on on the event page. You can use the hashtag Star Party on Twitter. Uh, I should be able to see it in every location. So I was going to jump uh, in. Active region, region. Just, right? Oh, oh Adam sorry. Alexander says active region. AR means active region. Uh, real quick, I was going to say, for the people who are wanting to try and uh, see whereabouts uh, the Ring Nebula is in the night sky, it's in uh, the constellation uh, Lyra. Um, if uh, you look in uh, the night sky for Vega in the Summer Triangle, uh, the Ring Nebula is kind of down and to the right a little bit of Vega. And um, I've got that pulled up on, uh, you've got it pulled up on Stellarium as well. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you so can see that shows a good picture where you can find it in the night sky. Yeah, let's we'll see yours here. Yeah, it's a it's a nice one to find because it's you can see Vega, um, and then you can see that Lyra is just these four stars that poke off of the edge of, of Vega, and um, and then you can find the Ring Nebula because it's right in between these little two end stars. So it's actually it's a really easy object to find. You know, if you can, you know, this is almost a degree. So if you can get these kind of two stars in your field of view, you can find the Ring Nebula in between them, and it's it's really easy to find. You know, probably one of the first const well, not a constellation, it's actually an asterism, I guess, is the is the Summer Triangle, and that is, and that's this. So you can see here's Vega, the constellation, or sorry, the constellation of Lyra, right? And you can see there's Vega, and then you can see the constellation of Cygnus, right? And you can see the constellation of Aquila, Aquila, um, with Altar. Tomato, and tomato. These, tomato, tomato. Yeah. And so then these three stars here form the Summer Triangle: Vega, Altar, and Deneb. And it should be one of the easiest constellations you can see in in the middle of summer. It's you know it's a it's a really good friend, and so uh, there's all kinds of really wonderful objects all in through here. And one of the other things, though, too, that I tell uh, newcomers to astronomy in the night sky, you know, during the summer, um, just like you mentioned, there's a lot of great objects in, in the Milky Way in that region of the Summer Triangle. The other thing is, though, too, knowing the Summer Triangle, there's a jumping off point, like you were pointing out, you know, with Cygnus and some of those, but above there, um, as you were showing in your picture, is Hercules, and again, you know, stepping stones and yeah. being able to easily recognize the summer triangle. There's so many other constellations that are easily recognizable that you can branch off from and at least use that to start learning the, the summer night sky uh, pretty decently. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, really know their summer night sky just because it's warm and you can sit outside and, and uh, watch the night sky. So, so John's got something new for us. John, what have we got here? This looks like M13. We have M80, which is a globular cluster Perfect. in Scorpius. Figured it'd be a good uh, contrast to what uh, someone else is going to bring up, M13, a little bit later. Yeah, absolutely. Are we going to have a Stellarium off here? Let's yep. <laughs> Um, is this, this is like Jeopardy, where the first person yeah. who hits the button wins a prize. Yeah, exactly. So here's uh, there's Scorpius. There, it really does look like a scorpion, doesn't it? With this tail, and then right up here, where the where its three claws are, um, right there's M80. So there you go, um, and that's what we're seeing which is great. And hopefully, I'm hoping Chris will, will be able to pull in some of these clusters as well. He's doing a great job of bringing some of these star clusters. I, I'm still a little light. I've just got um, blank sky, so I, I'll be a little bit... No problem. I can, you can, it's great to watch how it's getting darker for you out there. It's really cool. Um, oh, and is that your version of M13, Gary? Or is this M8 as well? No, actually, it's supposed to be M56, but that's just a 10-second shot of it. Let me uh, let me do a little longer.
And the M56, for those wondering, is just a little bit in an odd, interesting twist of fate, a bit uh, further below um, M57. It's, um, let me pull this up on Stellarum here real quick for all of you. And I made a mistake. I was thinking it's a dumbbell, but no, M56 is a uh, cluster. Yeah. So, I was be wrong. It's nice, though. M51, we'll definitely try to get M51. Uh, Tim Nath asked for that. We had that last year. That's the the, uh, the Whirlpool, right? Yes. Yeah, that's a beautiful galaxy. Uh, any interesting double stars? We definitely can. I think we had um, last weekend, didn't we? What's that? We had M51 last week, um, and Stuart... Stuart should be the one should be able to start giving us those views. Yeah, I'll be giving you. I've got M13, but it's uh, it's an interesting view actually. It's but it's like M13 in a blue sky. I'll, I'll okay. share that in a second. Yeah, I'll get yeah. it in one second. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, okay, uh, so I'm going to say hi to Patrick, the budding astronomer. Hi, Patrick. Do you have any requests tonight? What would you like to see? Oh, there's Peter. Very cool. The Australian contingent continues. So Peter is uh, joining us from Australia, but he's usually controlling his uh, wonderful 20-inch plane wave telescope in uh, New Mexico. Are you, are you, how's the skies for you, Peter? Yeah, good. Thanks, Fraser. Yeah. Yeah? You got clear skies tonight? Wow. Yep. Is it... Are we full of... Astro this is crazy. Okay, so look, count them up. One... We've got teal, although we've lost the sun now. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight telescopes tonight. So, um, Fraser, do you see my screen? I, I do see your screen, but I don't, I, it's just you still. Oh, it's still me? Okay. Yeah. Ooh, look at that. Gary, you've got the dumbbell there. I do. And that was a 10 second. I'm using, uh, doing a 60 second right now with uh, less bidding, so we'll get a little more detail. Oh, that's just gorgeous. Look at that. What is it, Ray? What is this thing we're looking at? The Dumbbell Nebula? Mm hmm. Fraser, so I do you see a little bit of a lag there, real quick? Do you see it um, now? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so oh, I see it. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Yeah, it's really bright, but I definitely see it. All right, I'll, I'm, it's getting dark fast, so I'll oh, be able to yeah. get a better okay. one. Okay. Huh. All right. Um, Astro Space Twenty Three wants to know uh, who controls the main video, the broadcast. That's me. I control the video. I click. I can. I can show you Ray. I can show you the Dumbbell Nebula. I can show you M A D. Ooh, Chris, what have you got? That's M2. M2. We're doing globular clusters tonight, aren't we? Look at that. Lots of clusters. Can you, Although, interestingly can you enough, focus in on that one, Chris? Like, just actually bring it up bigger? Embiggen it? <laughs> I, I can't bring myself embiggen. to say it, but yes, would you embiggen it, please? Um, or is it all actually, ready? I can't ready? on Backyard EOS. That's as good as it's going to get there. That's as big as it's going to get? Oh, that's too yeah, bad. Yeah, okay. with Backyard EOS. I can... Uh, let's see here. Yeah, that's so just to let people know uh, real quick earlier about the uh, Dumbbell Nebula, you can actually, if you're in a dark enough sky, uh, it is large enough to see in binoculars. And uh, we were talking last weekend during the virtual star party about the Messier objects being objects that frustrated uh, Charles Messier in his search for comets. This is actually the first planetary nebula uh, that he discovered. And uh, for those who weren't around last weekend, uh, planetary nebula is something that uh, when you have a, a red dwarf, or uh, not a red dwarf, but a, a red giant star that's nearing the end of its life, it'll kind of puff off layers. And that's what the, the planetary nebula is, is these shells that have been blown off from the star. <clears throat> and generally speaking, in the uh, center, you'll find the, the white dwarf ember of uh, what that star used to be. And so you can see here, so here's the summer triangle, right? Vega, Deneb. Vega, Deneb, and Altar, and, and the dumbbell is right at the, almost the very middle of this uh, triangle. So it's uh, very easy to find as well, especially with binoculars. And there's a 60-second shot of it, Fraser. Oh, it's just beautiful. Look at the, just the detail, all of the faint detail in it. 
And so this is great. So I, I Chris, that that uh, that cluster. I hope people are able to see it okay because it just looks beautiful. I could use um, the EOS utility to embiggen it, but that's what I'm going to do. That would be about the only way I could do it. But the, the, the backyard EOS should let you do that. I remember somebody using backyard EOS and able to not not in the pres not in the presentation view, which is what we're doing. So you're n so. Yeah, you can only do that in oh, the okay. planetary view. Uh, you can do the 5x. Yeah, okay, all right. I'm, well, I'm switching over to Canon, so um, it, it'll, well, it'll be all right. Okay. When you're in the imaging mode in Backyard EOS, you can only uh, see the entire picture you're taking. In the planetary, it lets you do 5x, but not in the imaging. Um, oh, a shout-out to eye telescopes, who's watching right now. That's really cool. Eye telescopes actually have uh, have offered to donate us some telescopes to be able to use, which is a really wonderful offer. We really appreciate it. Except we've got eight telescopes here tonight. Like we would have nowhere to put them. So um, I think it's really cool. Um, uh, yeah, that's a wonderful dumbbell nebula. That's beautiful. Thank you. I, and hopefully we get some contrast because if Stuart can bring up the dumbbell as well, or uh, or Chris, we can actually get it in color. Which is yeah, I'll be able, I'll be able to get it. I just need to get dark enough. Yeah, I don't know. Do you want to darken? And darken it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Um. Uh, can we sometimes get access? So Denny's wants to ask: Can we get access to Earthcast at some point and look at the Earth at night? Um, they haven't launched it, I don't think. So this is a really cool uh, camera that's going to be attached to the International Space Station. It's going to provide a a live view of the uh, of the Earth as the space station is orbiting, and it's going to be really cool. I don't think they're live yet. So if they want to participate, that would be great. Yeah, nice dumbbell. Do you want to try grabbing something else, John? Do you want to try the, the dumbbell? Can you see it? How is it for you right now? Um, I can I can go ahead and try for the dumbbell, sure. Yeah, go ahead and just go ahead and switch from object to object. I'll notice when you've picked up something new and, and switch over and interrogate you. All right, give me a bit here. Hold on. Yeah. Um, yeah, Wendy, uh, Wendy just asked, do I hear crickets, ambient night sounds? Um, yeah, it's... Uh, uh, we've got um, Chris has, has got his uh, his crickets in the background usually. Sometimes a, sometimes a bunny getting <laughs> mauled. Getting mauled. Mm -hmm. Is that your is that your telescope slewing there, Chris? Yes. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, Den is an X. Okay. Just out of curiosity, somebody with uh, some of the telescopes were uh, kind of getting a, a variety of different. Um, Different objects and stuff. Anybody want to try and pull up uh, Epsilon Lyra? That's a it's a variable star, right? It's the double double. If you've uh, with mm. a decent enough aperture, um, when you see it in like a small telescope or with binoculars, you see it as a double star. But with a larger telescope or really good atmospheric, then you can split both of the doubles and actually get four stars out of it. Yeah. So just throwing that one out there for a little variety because we've been getting a lot of globular clusters tonight. Yeah. Uh, somebody has requested the Lagoon Nebula. That we can do. Hmm. Yes. I'll get to that. I'm right there next to it anyway. Okay. That'd be great. So I'll show you where the Lagoon is. Oh, it's pretty low on the horizon for you, though, isn't it? Yeah, it'll be a little low, but I can still pick it up pretty good. Yeah. Mm, and someone asked for the sombrero. I don't think sombrero is up yet, but it should be in about an hour, I think. No, it's already gone down. Oh, it's gone down. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, Unfortunately. So I'll show you where the uh, but the the lagoon is a great one. Yeah, we we try to get it while we're doing the summer constellations. I'll just throw up my all sky camera um, in the meantime, which I know you love. And uh, it's got a great view of the Milky Way tonight. Oh, great. Uh, so um, Stephen Jett just asked, what planets are we able to see? So tonight, the only planets we're able to see are um, Saturn, 
and we're hoping to see Pluto. So that's all going to be down to uh, to Mike. And Mike uh, doesn't have anything yet, but we're 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 hoping that he will. Um. I'm seeing something else here, Mark. What have you got now? Is this still the wild duck, or is this a new cluster? I moved back over to M29, which I did uh, last weekend, and actually I'm seeing a lot more stars yeah. in it with the light pollution filter than I did last weekend. Do you want to try and get that double-double? I was looking for it to see if I could find it. Uh, it's called Epsilon something? Epsilon Mira. Okay. Lyra. Uh, Myra. E Epsilon Lyra. Oh, Lyra. Epsilon Lyra. Okay. Uh, you know about where it is in the sky? Um, it's in uh, Lyra. Let me just say, let me pull back, I switched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Epsilon Lyra right. kind of <laughs> hints that it's in Lyra. But, uh, yeah, I switched that to Lyra. Uh, do you want to start catalog number? Was that a different um, You're breaking up there. Let me see. Look in Lyra. I'm not sure which one is Epsilon, but... What do you got, Gary? Uh, in about five seconds, I'll have a one minute of the Propeller Nebula. The Propeller and Nebula? This, this is a new is one. This is a new one, it is. Nice! Uh, there we go. I totally see the Propeller. There's a one minute. You keep finding things that I've never even heard of. I wasn't even sure that I could get this one, but um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. Space is really big. You know, it's, it's not like I'd stroll down to the local chemist. Is there another designation for this? I have not been able to find any. Really? My uh, my hand controller on my telescope doesn't even know about it. I had to go to the right ascension and declination to get it. DWB111. DWB? D. DWB 111. Nope, didn't like that either. So oh, wait, yeah, no, I found it. it. Oh. What's it got? So it's in, uh, it's in Cygnus. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's um, very near the um, Pelican in North America. That is really cool. I've ne I've never even heard of this object. I can't believe you did this. Well, you know. I know you're full of surprises. I know. Oh, let's look at Peter's view here. Oh, look at that. So so Peter's got this great all sky camera, so you can see what the skies are like above his observatory. And so here we go. We've got a uh, beautiful Milky Way there. And uh, is that a plane or a satellite? That's a satellite just uh, streaking across. It's still fairly early. Just might zoom in a little bit there, and you can actually see a uh, beautiful, um, you know, the main part of the, the Milky Way there, yeah. and the, the satellite going across the north. That's fantastic. So I'm just um, running on the Dumbbell Nebula as well, and then I'll move on to one of the galaxies. Can you do M51? Uh, yes, I can do M51 next. Yep. That would be wonderful. Thanks. Let's go back to the uh, to the propeller. Wow, what a neat object! And that's the first time I've imaged it, so nice. I'm gonna have to do some long term on that. Yeah, that'd be great to see that. That's beautiful. Yeah, I'm just gonna go back to the sun for a little while because Teal's got some uh, clear skies again. I've got the lagoon for you, Fraser. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at that. That's a 45-second sub. So I hope the colors are coming and through. Before, <coughs> I was going to say, before everybody starts asking, what is the Lagoon Nebula? <laughs> what is uh, the Lagoon that's Nebula? That's actually an emission nebula. <laughs> <laughs> what's I was an trying to get ahead of you. What's an emission nebula? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's basically an area where you've got... Um, hydrogen gas that's being illuminated and um, gives off light, um, like what Fraser was saying, H2 region, um, that's a particular state of hydrogen and gives off a very telltale light signature. Um, 
And depending on what type of filters you have on your telescope, um, sometimes you can make it really pop with a H2 filter. That's just fantastic. I really love the uh, just the colors. You can see the reds and the the reds and the purples and the, all the colors in there. So it's important to understand a bit of the difference here. Um, we've got sort of we've got black and white cameras, which are really good for um, for more of the scientific work and, and actually for a lot of the best astrophotography that's done with the black and white cameras. And so the, for example, that's what Gary's got, and that's why you can see just the really crisp detail here. Um, uh, Peter has the same thing, so once we start to see his uh, some of his galaxy views, you'll see he's got the same sort of uh, sort of thing. Um, but uh, but Chris and Mark and John uh, and Stuart are all doing color views. So actually, they've actually hooked up their DSLR camera into their into their view. Um, are you seeing my, Are you seeing my M13 there? Yeah, yeah, okay. it's still very it's blue. It's still blue. It's uh, like I said, my skies are slowly getting darker, but you can kind of yeah. see it. So, but I think people can see this. So, M13 is the great globular cluster in Hercules, and it's one of one of our favorites. I'll try to get that epsilon lyra now. And actually, um, talking about earlier being able to see things with uh, binoculars and looking at things in the night sky, um, again, as we were pointing out earlier, looking at the summer triangle and being able to look above it and see Hercules, um, you actually, if you're in a dark enough sky, you actually can see this uh, not in as much detail as the camera shows, but you can actually spot M13 with just your bare eyes if yeah. you're in a sufficiently dark sky. It's about magnitude, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, it's close to seven, which is a little bit near the limit of most people's visual acuity uh, for stars, but definitely with people who have um, average, if not slightly better than average eyesight, it's, it's pretty easy to see. One of the other things that I really like about it as well is it's sort of situated in a place that's easy to find. So I'll show you here. So here's the constellation of Hercules, and so if you remember, we had the uh, we had the con the summer triangle. So it's cl it's located very close to the summer triangle, and you can see that Hercules. You can see the chest of Hercules here, and the uh, the the great globular cluster is in between two of the stars over on the right on the right hand side, and it's sort of at the halfway point in between those stars. And so you can actually um, sort of find one of the stars and then move down toward the other star, and you'll find it halfway in between there. So I, I really like it. Um, oh, I, I think I have to parent here for a second. Yeah, that's really cool. I like that a lot. Let's see. Let's keep moving. Whoa, they've changed the camera controls here on a little bit. Now see, that's a beautiful dark sky right there. Whose is that? I think we lost Frazier. Uh, yeah, he did. And he controls what's up on the screen. I chose you, Gary. Okay, I'm up. That's the uh, elephant trunk. Probably another one you've never heard of. <laughs> that's really cool. It is a dark nebula. So yeah. there's the glowing gas here, and then you get the dark nebula in this area. And that is, again, one that I didn't think I could effectively image. But um, there it is. That's a 60-second, and I'm halfway through at two minutes, so we'll see how it is with a little better definition. Still, it's a really interesting shaped is, uh, nebula. Yeah. yeah, it is between uh, and Cygnus and Cassiopeia. Yeah. Kind of near uh, Cepheus, actually. Actually, is it, it's actually in Cepheus, isn't it? I uh, don't show that on my chart, but that doesn't mean anything. Uh, Let me double check it real quick. I might be uh, off on my coordinates. That's another one that I've not heard of either. You're, you're bringing up all the, all the nice ones. Well, this time you can just sit there in the star program and cruise the Milky Way and see so many things that, you know, like I say, both of these, I had heard of them, but I never imaged them before. Okay. 
about six seconds, we'll have a uh, longer exposure. That's fantastic. That's really great. Um, so one blue bear asks, of the people with telescopes online, how many actually try or would know if there was ever a new nebula being lit up or something? Um, so, so we've had, um, uh, there was a new nebula that was actually discovered just a couple of years ago, right? It was in Orion. So people actually found a new nebula. But, you know, pretty much the entire night sky has been fairly well documented. So it's very rare for something new to show up. Yeah, an amateur found a bubble. Um, yeah. I can't remember which one it was, but uh, nobody had picked it out. It's not something that's new. It's been there for a long time, but uh, an amateur actually discovered it. Yeah. Um, there's the two minute. Wasn't on that the, one that's got that really strange name? Um, yeah. I, I can't remember the name of it, but it's Vor really bizarre. V O R W E E P, the Hanny. Right, Hanny. Well, that was a different creature, right? These were these strange green uh, peas, they were calling them, right? No, 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 Hanny's Road. That was a different creature. That's right, yeah, yeah. So um, there was a, man, history lesson. Um, so there was this online uh, citizen science project called Galaxy Zoo that Pamela was involved in where people were classifying galaxies. And, uh, and people were also finding all these strange, unusual objects, and they were bringing these to the eyes of researchers. And uh, one of these objects uh, this woman named Hanny from the Netherlands, I think, had said, what's this strange thing that I found? And uh, nobody knew what it was. And then it turned out it was a, I'm trying to think what it was. It was a jet coming out of a quasar, I think. Um, McNeil's, that's right. Yeah, one blue bear just mentioned McNeil's uh, nebula. That's the one. Yeah, that's the one that was discovered just a couple of years ago. So, um... What have we got? Feel free to move on to something else, Chris. And this is the uh, two-minute exposure, if you see a little just, bit more contrast. Just in general, for any of the astronomers, I mean, Gary, Gary knows how this works now, but for anyone who's, who hasn't joined us, like once we've already looked at what you've got, hey, feel free to find something new, and we'll, we'll take a look at it as well. I, I'm seeing, Stuart, I'm seeing uh, a sort of a, you're not showing your telescope. You're screen sharing uh, the hangout back at ourselves. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm... Turtles all the way down. Yeah, right. And in case you missed the sun, there's the sun. Teal, you're just like rock solid there. What's your telescope, Teal? Yeah, I've just got a um, an eight inch uh, CPC, so it's a uh, Schmidt category. And I think that's the exact same telescope that uh, that John's got as well. Eight inch uh, Celestron. C8. Yeah, I'm just getting a black screen from you. Yeah, that'd be the, the same. There, that's the lagoon. That is. Nice. That is, and that is just a 10 second. Let me give a little bit longer on it. Are you going to try and do a uh, um, an HDR on this one? Well, I'm just going to mute you there, Stuart. I'm getting a lot of noise from your background. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't do HDR live. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. That takes a little bit of work. Yeah. But uh, we're 15 seconds of the way into a 60 second, but uh, looking pretty good right there. Yeah, it looks really good. Yeah. yeah, I thought you said you had kind of bad skies tonight, but I think it looks good. Well, I do. See see how big the stars are? Yep. Um, when I, since I'm taking a long exposure, when I have bad seeing, the stars become bigger because they're moving all over the place. But it seems to have cleared up a little bit. It's not as bad as it was earlier. Oh, Peter's brought up the dumbbell. Um, I think I've got Epsilon Lyra there. See yeah. the double? See the double double there? Yeah. So yeah, that looks like it. Yeah. So why don't you explain what this is then, right? You asked for it. Yeah, so, <laughs> no, uh, like I was saying earlier, uh, so what that is is just a um, uh, pair of stars that, uh, under proper conditions, uh, you can actually split off into um, their components. So uh, what normal people will see with, like, binoculars or a small telescope, they'll see two stars. But with a larger telescope and good atmospheric conditions, you'll actually split those two into their actual binary stars. So uh, being able to see all four of them is... Um, 
some people say, oh, you don't need that good of a telescope to do it, and other, the, the fences out there between all the different astronomers, myself included, um, some people say it's a really good test if you're seeing, other people say it's a good test if you're equipped, other people say that they've actually been um, getting uh, more and more separated over the years, so it used to be something like in the 50s and 60s was a really good benchmark for good your optics. Sorry, but sorry now, Ray, you're, you're totally even, chopping up by the cheap telescopes. Yeah, you're totally chopping, chopping up. I'm not sure why, but you're, I don't know, if you've got some big torrent going on in the background or something. Um, now, I'm just going to break no, for a second I here. Don't. <laughs> and, uh, or if someone's watching Netflix. Um, I'm going to switch over to Mike for a second here. Mike, or at least talk to Mike. Mike, what have you got going on here? Yeah, so I think this is M25 here. I've got Stellarium on my other screen. Right? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll mimic you here as well. Let's All see. Right. My... my, my uh, my view seems to be flipped. I don't know if this is whether you guys see it or not. So to me, this is the left-hand side over here, and this is the right-hand side. You guys, you tell me if this is this is my right and this is my left. So I don't know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Right. Okay. So these these distinctive little chain of stars right here show up in my Stellarium with the extended catalogs here. So if you follow, so this is M25 here, right? <coughs> Follow these these little uh, kind of three cluster, three cluster, and then there's like a little almost a line here. You follow these down, and there's this little group of three down here. I'm getting a longer exposure. Let me show you some of these better here. Be too much better. Let's see. Yeah, there's I don't have that many stars in my. Of you here. I'm gonna I'll bring up all the stars in mine then. Let me oh see. yeah, here it is. One of these ones down in here. Uh -huh. Somebody, somebody, Sandy, can check me here. Keep on the spot. Do you want to keep searching? We'll move on to something else. There's so many other yeah. good stuff to see right now. Sure, sure. I okay. Can get. I've got Alberio now. Oh, great! Another double. Oh, yeah. Lots of double stars. Um, oh, Chris, you're going black. You can bring back what, whatever it was that you had. Um, I'm going to go to see Pierce. So you've got a little bit of star trailing in yours, Peter. Yeah, so it's just a good example of some of the things that can go wrong in a photo, too. <laughs> so this is a 300 ex um, a 300 second exposure and as you can see about halfway through um, there's been a little bump on the drive, um, <laughs> the tracking drive yeah. and so the stars have doubled up but you can still see most of the nebulosity of the yeah. nebula, so it's yeah. um, still quite nice but um, not, not perfect so that's great so I'll have that you can crack at it yeah well I, I mean probably like for you a 60 second exposure is probably enough I mean now you're just seeing it showing off whoa somebody's mouth is moving yeah I'm, I think that was Stuart um, okay <laughs> was I got something. the um, the 60 second of the uh, lagoon now oh wow and uh, you mentioned the HDR, so since you brought it up, um, HDR is high dynamic range. And if you look at the photo right now, you can see this whole center section is blown out, but I can see the wispy area. If I do this, if I cut it down, see now you see more in here, but the stars are still blown out. A uh, method that I just started playing with is to take some very short exposures and then some longer exposures and then once I process them then I put them together in software called HDR that takes it and increases the dy dynamic range so when you can see the stars where the stars are blown out it uses the darker exposure and where the wispy stuff is it uses the lighter exposure and right. I'm just starting to play with that so um, Alan Davidson and Sarah Madero want to know uh, what's going on with Pluto so we think Pluto is in this field of view here somewhere. Yeah. We, so we're not sure which one is Pluto. 
the problem is in Pluto's in the neck of the woods where the background is pretty much the center of the Milky Way. <laughs> it has always been hard to find. And uh, usually I sit here and, and kind of look at a sky chart and then look at the image and then I go back and forth until all of a sudden it pops out and makes sense. And I have my bearings, which is good. Uh, these three stars are what I'm looking at right now. And there's a, there's a bunch right in this little neighborhood here. I'm pretty sure it's one of these right here. Well, this is a two-minute exposure. And, and hey, actually, real quick. Um, so let me show you my view on Stellarium, but but I don't know if it's so. If you see here, I've got uh, I've got these two bright. Now I don't know if they're aligned in the same way as you do, but I got these two bright stars down down here, and then when I look at yours, I think I think Ray's got a better view. If you shift the focus over to Ray there, maybe maybe Ray move Pluto up in your field of view there, because you're you're pretty tight. You're like a ten. You've got more stars in yours, Ray. <laughs> yeah, he added the catalogs the same way as I did, and I see that, that, that cluster of about five or six stars there just to the left and a little below Pluto. Should be a good guide. Now i got a three and a half minute exposure. I'm going to pull that down see if that pops this out a little. <clears throat> uh, so Steve wants to know if we use photomatrix. Uh, photo matrix. Yeah, that's what, um, uh, that's what Gary was using for HDR was photomatrix. Photomatrix. Photomatrix, yeah. Photomatrix. Yeah. Yeah, so this this looks like it. So, do you want to zoom in a little more, Ray? I mean, I'm trying to think if that seems like it, isn't it? You got those two stars. How big is your field of view right now? Two of a degree, so that's pretty tight. Yeah, that might be too tight. Mine is um, my field of view is about a degree. So if you there, zoom, zoom out a little ways further, and then you'll get a, people a little better bearing where we're looking at here. Yeah, there you go. So there's those there's those two stars. So you see those two stars down at the bottom there, right? Hey, there they are hey, on the Ray, bottom hey, of Ray's view now. Control M for me, and it'll. Yeah, this is it. A little better. Yeah. Okay, we've got it, Ray. I'm I'm sure we've got it here. So you can see the uh, the three stars that form that kind of bright triangle in the middle of of the view. There, the Pluto is the, is the fourth part of that of that square. So I see it. It's it's one of these over here, right? No, no, it's up. Go up. Go up, Mike. So you see those three stars that are right in the middle of your field of view? That are forming a triangle, like a right angle triangle? I think if you if you follow these stars down, they kinda of, all this this little chain of stars here. Ray, you see what I'm talking about? Maybe you can highlight that. This uh yeah, yeah, gotta go it's like half underneath the text there. So this grouping here is very unique, almost like an arrowhead. There's one, two, three stars, and then like two, two on the tail. Well, you tell three. Yeah. See, <laughs> we we have it in the field of view. It's definitely there. <laughs> it's in there. Yeah. It's, we are it's looking there. At Let's come Pluto. back in a week. We'll take an image and compare. Um, there you actually, go. actually, I was going to ask um, because all of our views in Stellarium are uh, proper orientation. Uh, trying to kind of take what you can see in, in Stellarium and translate that. Uh, your your telescope doesn't have a, an erecting prism on it, does it? No, no, it's a Newtonian, and I have the camera oriented so that in this part of the sky it should be taken almost exactly the way it looks in Stellarium. Uh, if you have the okay, I just wanted to do, double check on that because. Uh, there, there have been times where I've been trying to find stuff in the sky and completely forgot that everything's different than how I'm looking out on right. the screen. Sometimes no, you, no, so we, so we over-focus on stuff. Yeah, if you look at the, the cluster of M25 up here and then you follow this little, this little chain of stars here, you, you have this little kind of asterism here under, half underneath the text of Pluto there. And then if you follow that down, you'll, you'll see all these... All these stars match up. Now you said you're filled. See this little cluster even in the middle of, of that, that triangle near Pluto. So Pluto is, is I think, one of these ones right here. Well, you said real stand up. About a degree. Yeah, it's about a degree. What is this star right here? Click on this okay. star. You see my little backwards L here on the top one there. What, what magnitude is that? Because that'll give us a gauge as to. Actually, I can look at it too. Backwards L. Yeah. Trying to find. That's a 10.5 magnitude star. So yeah, it, it would probably be one of the dimmer ones in here. There we go. All right. Well, I, I think we could do this all night. So I think we'll uh, we'll 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 say we found Pluto.
It's in here. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, it's I'll it's in the field of view. Nice comparison. It's in the field of view. Victory. We got it. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> There's a first. Actually, yeah. uh, you're in a certain yet in the field of view. I'll I'll hit those once they start rising before four o'clock in the morning. How's that sound? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe Ahmet can pull that one in for us. Yes. He's in turkey time. Better time. So, okay. so here we go. Somebody wanted M51, and Peter has uh, just nailed it. Look at that. Oh, that's gorgeous, Peter. Wow. Yeah. I, again, the, there was still a little slip. We're just going to reset a couple of things here. We, not it's perfect, hard because but, uh, you're stunning image. It's just a beautiful, um, beautiful uh, detail in that one. If you want to throw it up on the big screen, Fraser. Have you got a view of? Yeah, I've got it up on the big screen now. Have you got a view, a, a view of Saturn yet, Stuart? I don't know if you can hear me. Um, but uh, that's gorgeous. Look at that. Peter, is that a hydrogen alpha filter? Uh, sorry, Not Fraser, it's behind a tree for me. Okay. Uh, and my backyard EOS keeps crashing, so I have to switch programs. No problem. No, it's just That's luminance, just Gary. You said it's a hydrogen alpha filter through there? No, luminance, yeah. Oh, lumen. okay. That's gorgeous. This, uh, all that bright area around the smaller galaxy, I can't even pull out with my hydrogen alpha here. you got a great <laughs> sight. Yeah. Well, it's just, I mean, there's two things that Peter's got going in his favor. One, he's got a perfectly dark sky sight. So he's miles away from any light pollution at all. And second, his telescope is 20-inch, right? Yeah. 20-inch plane right. wave, which is probably another six inches larger than, uh, than Gary's telescope. So it's a, it's a really big telescope. It's a, just a tremendous piece of equipment. Now you actually use it for science. I mean, you don't just show off the cool views of the star parties. You actually no, use it for I'd, doing variable stars. Or yeah, this is a bit of a treat for me because uh, most of I've done uh, a lot of work on variable star FSAUR, which is FS Origae, and um, been doing some exoplanet research with... Um, with uh, Eugene Sokolov up in uh, Russia, so uh, through through the um, transit ED database, um, tracking some of the Kepler targets that were in the public um, public data that they released. Yeah, it's just a phenomenal. So it's a real treat when you when you've got dark skies and you're able to join us, and when no one notices at work that you've got a uh, galaxy up in your in your computer. Uh, but I'm going to go back and take a look at what Gary's got right now. That looks this like the Trifid Nebula. It is the Trifid. That is what it is, and that's a 60-second uh, exposure. And that's always a fun one because you got real nice dark lanes in here. and There's a lot going on in there. Yeah, that's phenomenal. <clears throat> And then Chris has got his view of the Triffid at the same time. That's great. Nice, Chris. Looks like I was muted, sorry. Yeah, I muted you. There was a, there was a lot of background noise going on. Huh. But I don't know if people could see it. It's this sort of faint red. Um, but you can see the dark dust lanes over on the right-hand side of the view here. It's beautiful. Yeah, let me. I'm gonna bump up my exposure here. Yeah. See if I can pull a little bit more out of it. Yeah, color really does this one justice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been playing around now with. Uh, I know Chris and uh, and Stuart and uh, Ahmed have been doing a lot of experiments with with using uh, their their DSLRs for doing uh, deep sky stuff. And we've just had some gorgeous views. I mean, Amit was just blowing my mind over on the weekend. Uh, he's located in Turkey, so unfortunately he can't join us until until the nights get uh, the nights get longer, and that way our night is his early morning, and he can show us some other stuff. So hopefully, in another month or so, he'll be able to start joining us. Um, but uh, uh, he was showing, you know, some of these clusters and, and just amazing stuff. Getting a lot of jingling noise, Chris. I will show you the, uh, 
what I'm looking at right now is this little, uh, I guess it's like an inverted arrow here, this little group of three with a little... Are you still searching for Pluto? I am. Well, I'm, I just want to, just, just so you see it now, mostly live, I took it about five minutes ago, I think Pluto is this one right here, underneath my arrow. Because this is a fortune. That seems to be about right based on. Um, yeah, you're really breaking up that there. That seems to be right with kind of how I frame everything in Solar. Yeah, Ray, you're you're really breaking up. Sorry, you got uh, like some kind of really. You could try dropping and coming back in, maybe, but your your audio is really. But he's not torrenting. Sure. He's not torrenting and not watching Netflix. Not while the, not while this is being. <sighs> no, I really think it has something to do with the storms out. Sorry, guys. I'll be right back in a minute. Okay. It could be this great big solar storm we were talking about. Yeah, no, so this is what I was talking about, Mike. I was saying that there was, that it formed, like, the three stars formed the corner of a square with Pluto right. forming the fourth part of that square. Yeah. I wasn't yeah, yeah. crazy person. Yeah, it, it, it's dim, but, yeah, I think you're right. You're right. Yeah. This, this so one right here. Right there. Yep. I dare somebody to prove us wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stuart, I'm muting you. Um, nothing personal. And look, steady teal in Australia, the sun just always there with this beautiful... What I love yeah, about no, I've got this, really great seeing at the moment. Yeah, it's really good. What, what I love about this is the fact that any one of these views is uh, would be a treat for the whole night. I'm kind of I'm overwhelmed with options. It's a it's a great night. So thanks to everybody who's uh, showing up. I know we're running a little bit of a longer star party if everyone's still got got energy because this is just phenomenal. I'm good. Yeah. Boy, what what's next? What's next on your list of treats, Gary? What have you got? Well, I'm trying to get the pipe and the pipe stem nebula. Now, right here in the center is NGC 6355, which is a globular cluster. I can get in a little bit. It's a pretty small one. But there's some nice dark nebula, and I think it's going to take more exposure. Uh, like the elephant trunk, there's some dark nebula here, and then there's some off to the side. So, so this on the left, you can see just general nebula. It's just glowing gas. And then there's the pipe stem. Uh, the pipe nebula, the pipe stem, um, is very similar to the elephant trunk, but I'm not getting a real good view of it right now. And again, that's another one I've never looked at, so let's try a two minute and see if we can pull something out there. Uh, uh, Fraser, do you have my color ring? I sure Gorgeous. do. Wow. Beautiful. Hold on, I got some background noise here. I'm just going to deal with this. Very nice, Stuart. That's another one that just um, black and white doesn't do it justice. Yeah, this was this was a 90 second ex uh, sing, uh, exposure, and I've just zoomed in on the raw picture right here. That is phenomenal. I love the, and it's the quite, colors. It's quite a small object too. Um, in you know, um, it's very difficult to get really close into that one, and uh, that's a great shot of it. I'll go over to dumbbell next. Yeah. So there that's you go. So you see. So this is. I mean, if you've been sticking right from the beginning, we had that that view of it from uh, from Gary in the beginning, and that was in black and white, and now we've got the view in color from uh, from Stuart, and it's just phenomenal. <laughs> Teal, yeah, we're gonna do. We're gonna have to do an Australian version of this, where we where we, we see. You got to show us some of the stuff in your night nice sky. I want to see the the what was it Omega Centauri, the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds. I'd love to see all that stuff. Oh, they got some oh. of the best nebulas there are down there too. Yeah. Oh, we've definitely got to try and get the LMC and the SMC. That's just that, yeah, that's that just, just too good to pass up. Yeah. So we'll do a we'll do a sort of. Uh, other half of the world uh, star party at some point. And also be great to be, you know, it's so late for people. I mean, I know we're doing this at 10 o'clock on the West Coast, and it's like 1 in the morning on the East Coast. So <laughs> it would be great to get that, uh, to get sort of something that people can see earlier in the day. So we'll, we'll, we'll get organizing. 
So the, um, we've got about uh, about five astronomers that are in that uh, sort of on that half of the Earth as well. Oh, that's we've got beautiful, the open Chris. Day at the open day at Siding Springs on 6th of October, so we might be able to organise something uh, around that time frame when we'll be up on the mountain. That'd be fantastic. Any luck with that longer view, Gary? I think this one didn't work. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little bit more out of it. You can see it um, right down in here on the picture. Oh, it's, it's, so it's, it's another dark nebula. Dark nebula. It's part of the pipe stem. Yeah. But that one's going to take uh, long exposures to get anything out of. Yeah. But it's worth a try. So, Chris, this uh, which is this? This is M22. M22. And I've got a 60-second exposure trying it right now. It's phenomenal. It, you're always off to the right. I'm just wondering, is that uh, the way you have it aligned? Yeah, my alignment doesn't... I do a quick two-star align so I can get it up and going really quick, and it uh, brings everything off to the right a little bit. And what kind of mount do you have, Chris? Uh, the LX90. Okay, I've got a CG5, and mine actually is a little to the left when I do the uh, three-star alignment. Um, so usually doing check stars, I, I, like you were saying with yours, you just did a quick to get up and running. I, I find the same thing. Like if I try and do a quick alignment, I'm off in like a little bit of a direction. And here's a 60 second coming up right now. There we go. What's this, Mark? This is my backyard. Uh, when I was trying to get SLU to uh, that double-double, uh, my telescope bottomed out and messed up my alignment. I didn't feel like uh, realigning everything, so I just uh, threw my lens on my camera and threw it on a tripod. So now I'm just... Uh, this This is uh, my backyard facing east, northeast. So is that Ursa Major? No. No, the... Uh, I think that is uh, the bottom part of, let me look at it, just to make sure it is, um, I'm just going to go back to the sun, that's so cool. No, I think you're right, Frazier, it's awesome that we can have all these night sky objects and the sun. And if we get everything up and going, we'll have northern hemisphere objects, southern hemisphere objects. It'll, yeah. it'll be a buffet for all the lovers of the night sky. Yeah, yeah I'm really, uh, it's, it's definitely coming together. And as always, if anybody wants to participate and join us, we're always glad to have more astronomers. It's just been, uh, it's great. And, you know, I, everyone is welcome um, while we... Uh, just because it's great to show, show off different sizes and different conditions and different telescopes and different cameras and just kind of give you a real sense of, of what you can do. I mean, you know, I'm trying to think here. If we sort of run through the technology here, I would say Mark and Chris, you have about the same telescope, right? You guys both have... Uh, we both have Meads, but his is way better than mine. Uh, mine's, you know, like a four or $500 telescope. His is probably... Closer to a thousand. A thousand, yeah, yeah. So, so you got sort of, but I mean, when we had the, your views of the moon, the moon, you were, you were the star of the show. So, oh yeah, I mean, mine's mine's great at the moon and some of the planets, but it it just can't track well enough to get any of these long exposures. You know, Gary's pulling yeah. a two minute exposure and he's solid as a rock, and you know, yeah. it's all I can do to get a, a tenth of a second. Yeah. What focal ratio are you? Uh, why do you have to ask me a question about numbers? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because you mentioned that your telescope is great with planetary and that you're having trouble with tracking. And I've noticed that telescopes with um, higher focal ratios usually are a little more fidgety, whereas, you know, like mine, I can be pretty sloppy with my alignment because I'm at f4. And actually, it's like 3.9 and some change. And I found that I can be pretty sloppy and still get pretty decent stuff, but it, my scope is absolutely worthless for any planetary stuff. It's all deep sky objects and 
and, and such like that. Although same right now thing. it's even more worthless because it's monsoon season. So <laughs> yeah, same thing I've got. It's uh, I'm a f1.9. Oh man, are so, you running the are you running the hyperstar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. it's um, I have a degree by a degree and a half is my field of view with this camera. Oh goodness. <laughs> I, I love the wide field stuff, but planetary, it just sucks. <laughs> um, so yeah. one blue bear asked, uh, what does track mean? Does the telescope move when you expose? Is it like a motor or manually? So, um, yeah, so the telescope is, they're on a mount, and the mount is, I don't know if, Gary, if you can show your view of your, of your telescope. Uh, um, yes, the telescope's on a mount, and the mount is designed to keep directed at a very specific part of the, of the sky. And uh, and try to so it can it can gather photons for a long period of time. Um, so Stuart, you you moved away from the dumbbell. That was beautiful. No, I'm I'm just coming back. Okay, okay. I was going to explain it in a second here, but I looked up my focal ratio. It's thirteen point eight. Oh yeah, that'll <laughs> that'll make tracking a little a little more work than uh, for some of us who've got you know single digit uh, f ratios. So so here you go. So so Gary, maybe you can explain sort of how the tracking works, the way yeah. it uh, lets you track um, on an object. This is set up. This is we're looking at the scope live, and it is set up where this axis running right through here is aligned with the Earth's axis. And then the scope mounts here, and then you can see it down at the bottom when I lower the camera, I'm going to get my glare, but there's weights on the end here. So when this right here is aligned with um, the, the, the Earth, the poles of the Earth, then all the camera has to do, all the scope has to do is move, let me, right here, all it has to do is move these weights and the telescope against that and follow the movement of the stars in the sky. And you can see a similar picture. Um, I brought a screen share of my telescope um, just to kind of show that same thing where you can see the, uh, the two different axes where the telescope turns in one direction and then you've actually got um, the other axis that uh, counters the rotation of Earth. Uh, David Kerner wants to know, is there a tutorial on the types of cameras and software being used? We're actually using so many different cameras and so much different kinds of software that it's hard to even sort of start. Uh, so there's probably five different kinds of cameras being used here and multiple different kinds of telescope. But I think the, the best way to go about this is I would say the way Chris and uh, Teal and, and Mark are doing this. So what they've got is they've got a DSLR, like a Canon DSLR, that's just connected to their telescope. I'll just, I'll just give you a, sort of an, an idea. While you're doing that, uh, Fraser, yeah, that's exactly um, like what he's so working actually, on. I've actually ordered a scope ring for, for this guy, so I was going to start doing some, to show some demonstrations. But uh, So this is my little, can this is my Celestron first scope. Um, so what and those do, things are awesome. Yeah, I know it's a great little telescope. I love it. Yeah. Um, so you, you what you do is you pull out the eyepiece, right? And then you can buy a special eyepiece adapter that that on the one end is is the eyepiece and on the other end is a big sort of um, uh, it's an adapter. It's like a it looks like a threaded thing. And then you can take that and attach it directly to your camera. And so what that does is that puts your camera uh, right onto the top of your telescope like this. And so then you can then use, you know, you can just take pictures. Your, ca your camera is now your, um, your CCD and you just start taking photographs. And this is what, uh, I think, Stuart, you're doing this right now too, right? Correct. Do you see yeah. my dumbbell right now? Yeah, we do. It's beautiful. Yeah, this, this is just a two-minute exposure uh, just with my, my Canon. Now, it's a modified Canon, but um, it's, still, you know, it's still just a Canon I bought used, and yeah. um, it's, it's nice. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of people are using these old, you know, like, even like a Canon, like a T1i, you can pick them up for a couple hundred dollars now. That's exactly yeah, that's what I have. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah and I have it. Yeah. I have a T1i as well, and uh, like I was saying uh, last, uh, for like a testimonial, 
uh, last weekend uh, when I was talking about it, I kind of fought and fought and fought with the CCD, and once I got a DSLR, it completely changed my astrophotography life. Um, yep. With a, a remote shutter, they're like five bucks on Amazon. Stick that on your DSLR, stick it to your telescope, and you know, with most any telescope, um, even if you don't have a tracking telescope, you can still take you know short 10 second exposures, take a bunch of those, and learn how to stack them, and still get something decent to start off with. Yeah. Um, Stuart, when you say that your camera is modified, uh, do you mean that you had the infrared modification? Correct, yes. I had the, okay. uh, the uh, IR filter that Canon puts in there removed and then a, a beta filter put in. And what that means is that the um, regular, the regular Canons, um, and any any DSLR actually, um, has a, a filter in it that blocks a certain uh, type of infrared uh, that um, is good for daytime photography. But what it does is it cuts out uh, the uh, emission nebula. Uh, spectrum and so you replace that filter with another filter and it allows you to do um, uh, astrophotography a little bit easier things are a little bit brighter you can do it without um, but what it what it does if you try to take daytime photography is it makes gives everything a little red tinge and you have to do custom white balance and it's not that big of a deal but it's just something that you just have to do with it yeah, and I was just gonna getting ready to mention the, the with the custom white balance, you can easily if it's the the family family's camera, which I've been afraid to do the IR mod on on mine because it's the family DSLR. My wife would kill me if I made it to where we couldn't take uh, pictures of our kid playing in the yard and stuff. But with a custom yeah. white balance, it it's totally you know a, a dual purpose. So if you don't have extra money to go buy one specifically for your telescope, it's it's a I, I guess for lack of a better term, a harmless modification to your camera. You know, now can, you, we, uh, can you turn that around, Mark, so we can actually see the, the back end where you've got the, the Canon goes into it? Yeah, so you see he's got the T-ring adapter there on the back of the telescope there, and so that's where he would then just directly clamp on his, uh, his DSLR, and then that just turns it into the CCD. So yeah, right, right here the uh, camera just clips on right there, just like the makes the telescope a big giant lens. The problem I have with this setup is it's a fork mount, so there, it's between a fork. So if I slew too far up, the camera and the T adapter hits the base, and then once it does that, the gear starts spinning and the the, the alignment of the telescope gets off, and then I have to go through the the project of realigning. Um, just I, I want to just take a second and appreciate what Peter's delivered. This is M101. Uh, what a wonderful galaxy. That's phenomenal, Peter. Yeah, this, this is um, a stunning galaxy. You may remember last year there was a big supernova in here, which was one of the, the brightest in, in many years. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, you can see when, when they talk about the arms of the spiral galaxy, you know, you can certainly see them um, you know, streaking out. And, and those knobbly bits out in the arms when you photograph it in color are quite red because of a lot of hydrogen. And how how and long exposures are you so doing for this, quite, Peter? quite interesting. Is this a no, that's, that's just a 300-second 300, 300 luminance, yeah. Can you, can you try doing shorter exposures? I mean, they've, they're phenomenal, yeah, yeah, but uh, okay. they take... You know, try like 60-second ones just because, I mean, yeah. they're amazing. Uh, but uh, maybe we can get more objects going out of you than... Um, and Fraser, since yep. um, people were questioning on how we do this, I'd like to recommend, uh, there's a program called Nebulosity, and the guy who does it, it's Stark-Labs, S-T-A-R-K-Labs, and you can download the manual there uh, free, yeah. and it is one of the best put together. Oh. It talks about CCDs, it talks about LSRs, the positives and negatives, and the methods of doing all of this, so it's well worth going through that manual. Yeah, and yeah. and I use uh, Nebulosity and uh, another one from the same company for running your guide camera, and that's kind of a little more of an advanced astrophotography topic uh, that we might cover in another night. But uh, yeah. another one of their pieces of software is PhD Guiding, and I that's what I use to to guide when I actually do get an opportunity to do images and great little yeah. piece of software. That's also the one, and that one's free. That's the one yeah. I use to guide. Mm -hmm. So, Fraser, if you want to 
Uh, so I'm sorry, I have, I have the Whirlpool Galaxy here. I'm going to get a longer exposure, but I want to show it to you before, I, uh, before this goes away. That's great, yeah. Yeah, so was, we were just mentioning, right, that the, and TM Nath just, just mentioned this, which is exactly right, which is that for us to sort of, what we're talking about here is, um, is the, the detector, right, that you're using your DSLR as a detector to, for your astrophotography, but you're still going to need some kind of tracking on your telescope. But Mark has got a great example with his T-mount on that Mead. You know, that's a, like you said, probably a $500 telescope that, that does tracking, and so it'll keep, um, if you, I don't know if you watched it, Mark had the stars that he was viewing dead center this entire hangout. And same thing that Teal's got. He's got a T-mount on this as well, I think. Um, but same thing, you know, so the mount is what's keeping the view going the whole time. Uh, with, with Gary, he's taking his mount to the next level, or his tracking to the next level. And so if you can see up in the top there, you've got that little telescope there. That's a guide telescope. And so what it does is it keeps a star perfectly in a crosshairs. And so you, de you designate the star that you want. Um, and then it will keep that star perfectly aligned, and so because that star is dead in the crosshairs, that means the main telescope is perfectly aligned, and he can track a star for he can track a field of view for an hour, and yeah. still you know things aren't going to move on it because it's and only then making these hours. tiny adjustments. You know, there's also another one, um, uh, a star tracker that you can put in your image train, basically, um, you know, between your um, your telescope and your actual camera, where it's got mirrors. And it'll kind of detect, and it'll do the same thing. Uh, not quite, you know, like the adaptive optics on the Keck, where it's moving the mirrors at, you know, a thousand times per second. But they will use mirrors to kind of um, adjust so that you're not moving the telescope as much. Um, it's a little bit of a different technology than, you know, throwing a camera on a small telescope and, and doing that yeah. route. That, by far, that's the the method by using a, a guide cam and a and a guide uh, scope. That's been the method that I've seen a lot of uh, backyard astronomers I know and, and a lot of the other people here on the Hangouts. But I have seen some people use the, the Star Tracker module in their image train, and sometimes you can do a combo of the two. I'm, that's a little bit beyond me, but um, your results might vary. Yeah, one of the people who, who joins us sometimes, um, Corey, he doesn't have a, uh, any kind of tracking, and so he does hand guiding. And you can tell he's hand guiding it because the, you know, he, it moves and then he has to move it back and then he moves. So, so I have to hand guide this telescope, right? And so, you know, if it got to move and look and move it up and move and move it up and you know, as the night sky is is moving. Of course, it's not the sky isn't moving. The Earth is rotating. So, so I think we've been at this for now for probably an hour and forty minutes. I think this is getting to be one of our longest star parties. But what a treat to have uh, eight telescopes going all at the same time. This is a record by two uh, at least. So I'm uh, I'm really really impressed. So I would like to thank everybody who uh, who donated their time to show everyone the view of the night sky. Really appreciate it. Thanks to uh, everyone who watched us tonight. Um, we'll be doing this again every Sunday night, uh, you know, depending on the weather. We, we get what we get, depending on what time of year it is. We get what we get. But uh, I hope you uh, all had a really good time, and I hope you learned a lot. So, uh, so thanks a lot. Thanks to everybody for joining us. Thanks for everyone watching us. And uh, we'll see you guys all next week. Good night, everybody, and thanks. Okay, bye. Good night. Good night.